Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's lunchtime chat in our environmental and health series. I'm Wendy Mandel Rubenstein, a board member for Exposomics and Children's Environmental Health at Mount Sinai. I've been involved with Mount Sinai's in health initiative since 2009. This series is designed to be relevant to families, to our daily lives, and to empower individuals with new information about the latest research happening at Mount Sinai. Today, we will hear from Dr. Manisha Rora, who will share some insights into his research and the opportunities for early intervention in autism. Autism is affecting more and more families. In December of last year, the CDC found that one in 44 eight-year-olds had been diagnosed with autism in 2018. Meanwhile, just two years earlier, the rate was one in 54. While we may not fully understand the causes of this concerning trend, what parents need now are solutions to help put their kids on the best path forward. Today's presentation will be about 25 minutes long, followed by 20 minutes for questions. Please use the Q&A function on your device and we'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Manisha Rora, an environmental epidemiologist and exposure biologist. Dr. Aurora is the director of the Environmental Exposure and Precision Environmental Medicine Laboratories within the Institute for Exposomic Research at Mount Sinai. He's known for his groundbreaking work in analyzing tooth and hair samples to reconstruct past environmental exposures as far back as those experienced before birth. If you're interested in learning more about the theory underpinning Dr. Aurora's work, you can read his new book, which is written for a public audience. It's called Environmental Biodynamics. And with that, Dr. Aurora, I'm now turning it over to you. Wendy, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And, and thank you to all, all the members of the community who have joined. Um, I'll start off by sharing my slides. And Wendy or Carla, if you could confirm that you can see them in, in presentation mode, please. Yes. Thank you very much. So today we'll be talking about autism spectrum disorder uh, generally, but one specific aspect of autism, which is actually its diagnosis, detecting it early enough so that we can deliver intervention that could potentially be life-changing. Let me start off by recapping what, what Wendy so eloquently has um, already described. But before I do that, uh, like any good professor, any good scientist should do, I would like to declare my conflicts of interest. Uh, I'm a professor here at Mount Sinai, and I direct a lab uh, that develops new technologies for environmental medicine. Often when these technologies reach a certain stage of maturity, uh, and I must really thank the leadership of Mount Sinai, they take it out into the world to make it available to the general public. This is in the form of setting up partnerships with sometimes other academic institutions or even for-profit institutions. And recently we set up our own startup and I, I, will, I will discuss that with you. But it also creates a financial conflict of interest, which I very much like to declare right up front before I speak. So as I was saying, and, 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 and Wendy has so nicely mentioned this already, the prevalence of autism has just been increasing quite dramatically. I was born in the 1970s, and that's when, you know, the, the best data that we can conjure up says it was about one in 10,000 children received this diagnosis. Now, a lot has changed since then. The very definition of autism spectrum disorder has changed. Our ability to detect it has improved, and also the general awareness has changed. However, we have reached a point where now it affects two to 3% of all children in the United States. And similar data comes to us from Europe and other parts of the world. So this is a major public health issue now. There are several aspects to the autism tsunami as it's called that are unique to neurodevelopmental disorders, disorders of the brain. And I'm going to discuss those in, in a very sequential manner to convey to you how at the Institute for Exposomic Research, we are tackling these, these very big public health problems. Let me start off by briefly, just in very general terms, uh, in case someone is not familiar with autism, to convey what, what it really is. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder. It affects young children, 
uh, there's a heritable component. So if you have one child with autism, the risk of subsequent children in the same family having autism goes up. So there is definitely a genetic component, but that's not all there is. We know such a rapid increase in prevalence can't be explained by genes. So there's definitely an environmental component as well. Perhaps the biggest challenge for diagnosing autism spectrum disorder is that there is no single FDA approved biomarker. Now compare this situation to uh, some other conditions. For example, if you have diabetes, we would expect to go to our physician and get a blood test done. And based on that blood test, as well as the expert uh, and experienced opinion of our physician, we would reach a diagnosis that would be considered gold standard. Here we have no test, there's no biochemical marker. So autism is diagnosed entirely on the presentation of a child's behavior. And this is where the situation starts getting complicated. Uh, this, this, it snowballs into many other problems because in the absence of this objective biochemical uh, approach of detection, there is immense variability in the quality of care that children with autism receive and even in who gets the label of having autism spectrum disorder. So now the latest CDC data, which was published in December of last year, because of the absence of a biomarker says that, well, on average, children in the US get diagnosed when they're about four years and two months of age. But that there's an enormous range around that. For example, and, and this is CDC's own words, but if you live in California, you get uh, diagnosed with autism much sooner. Whereas if you live in Minnesota, it takes longer. And it also depends on how severe your, your condition is. If you have an IQ below 70, which is a, a very severe IQ deficit because the average IQ in the general population is about 100. Then if you have a, a more severe type of autism, you can get detected sooner because obviously your symptoms are more easily detected. So there's all of this variability, again, arising from the, from the fact that we don't have an objective uh, biochemical marker. There's another, um, I, I should say, there are several issues that arise from the absence of a biomarker. Now let's take a, a very general look at how our brain develops. After all, autism is a disorder of brain functioning or neurodevelopment. I, I, I've shown this graph many times. It's about 20 years old, but it is uh, one of my favorite graphs to show when I'm speaking to the general audience, that our brain actually starts accelerating its development in the third trimester. So if you look at the x-axis, this is our age. So minus three means we're in the third trimester just before birth. And within the first year, this green band, or yeah, well, the, the green band goes up to three years, but towards the end of the green band, which is the first year, so much is happening. We are learning how to see and hear, and based on that, we are developing language, but we're also developing higher cognitive functions. And all of this ability, this plasticity of the brain, this ability to learn new things, starts dropping soon after the age of about one year. And by the time you're about four years age, you can see how these graphs have, have, have started going close to the x-axis. Again, our ability to learn new things has diminished. I found this uh, at the Smithsonian uh, Institute's website. It is such a nice way, and, and it has origins in even evolutionary biology that says that humans are unique, that our brain growth is just so much more rapid than our nearest you know, uh, primate uh, cousins, the chimpanzees and, and, and the other, other apes and mammals of, of any sort. And that's what sets us apart. So, here, the message again is the same as I showed you in the earlier slide, that the first 18 months, this yellow band here is absolutely crucial. That's when our brain is really developing. And that's when we have this critical window of opportunity. If we deliver an intervention, then we can have long lasting effects and bigger effects, bigger improvements. But now let's take a moment to go back to what the CDC just reported in December of last year. They said autism is diagnosed here, well after the yellow band of rapid brain growth ha has, has stopped. We are detecting autism 
way too late. So not only is there an uneven detection of autism, not only is the detection of autism very subjective, the absence of an objective biomarker for autism also means that we are too late in finding the kids who need help. This situation appears only more per perplexing because we actually have interventions that can help children with autism. The, the statement above is from the journal Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Academy of, of Pediatrics. And they had an expert committee. And one uh, statement that they put in there about autism was that early diagnosis and intervention can have a positive impact on the developmental outcomes of children with ASD. Now, I don't want to leave you with just a summary statement like that. So what I did was I went and quickly summarized several studies that support this finding. Not every study has found that early intervention works, but here is several of them. And I purposely chose studies from different countries because the practice of autism diagnosis and even its treatment varies in different geographical region. I'm not going to go through each study, but this is there for those who want to look at these slides later and have a deeper dive. In all of these studies, if early intervention was delivered, the children had lasting benefits. And again, this isn't, this isn't the case in every study that has been done, but more and more studies are showing this. One of my favorite studies on this topic is the one done in the UK. That's, num that's the, the third from the top and, and also the fourth one. They are the same participants, but then the researchers went back and looked at the children 10 years later. And they found that the benefits of early intervention, even though therapy had been stopped 10 years or so ago, they have still persisted. So early intervention doesn't just improve the, the various phenotypes or the behavioral limitations in autism. Some of those improvements are actually there for the long term. So it's, it has long lasting positive impacts. Now, that's the problem. I've, I've, I've spent the first few slides just describing the enormity of this challenge. This is the Institute. This is the Mount Sinai Institute of Exposomics contribution to this area. Many of you would have heard the term of precision medicine. What we are practicing is precision environmental medicine. And let me take a few moments to describe what, what this means and, and how it's different to a very genomic view of precision medicine. As you have probably seen, and, and we keep getting, we keep seeing ads for companies that will you know, take a sample of blood or saliva and send you some information that is based entirely on your genetics. Uh, some will say your risk of uh, a disease is high or low. Others will even tell you about your ancestry. The harsh, re harsh reality is that most of these test results are highly inaccurate. You can actually go back about three months. There was a very nice article in the New York Times that describes the level of inaccuracy of some of these solely genetic tests. And that has been the case for autism spectrum disorder as well. Much of our effort in the past 10 years has been around using genomic techniques only to try and detect autism, and they have not been successful. So our focus is not to exclude genomics, but also to focus on the non-genomic parts, which are the environmental parts. As soon as you start thinking of the environment as a scientist and uh, as a researcher in exposure biology, there is one big difference for me. Your genes are pretty much set at conception. They're static. So I can measure your genome at any time, and I can pretty much capture most of it, except for some epigenetic changes, which do happen later in life. Whereas the environment is changing all the time. The environment is changing at a time scale of hours, days, weeks. What you eat in the morning for breakfast is different to what you eat at night. If you commute to work, your exposure to air pollution is different than what you are exposed to when you're sleeping at home. So even within a day, there are variations. So how do I map? How do I map this constant change in our environmental input and our body's response to that environment. We call this temporal dynamics, change over time. And my lab has devoted, uh, you know, since we moved to Mount Sinai in 2013, a, a, a very significant effort in capturing what happened to us in the past, but in a time-dependent manner. 
Let me explain the basic idea behind how we do it. So if you look at uh, the top left of the screen, you will see a tree with growth rings in it. The idea is in fact very simple and has been with us for centuries. People have been looking at these growth rings in trees. And if you count back, each ring represents a year. And let's say we find a ring that's really broad. You can say, well, the tree grew rapidly that year. If you find another ring that's really small or really thin, something happened. Maybe there was a drought or some other unfavorable climactic condition that prevented the tree from growing. And in, in that manner, we are building a temporal dynamic profile. Early in my career, I used to be a dentist before I became an environmental epidemiologist. And I realized there are similar growth rings in baby teeth. And we started using them. We did a lot of work on autism detection using teeth, but there was a big problem there. Baby teeth shed out around the age of five, six years and older. By then, again, as I've shown before, it's too late to deliver early intervention. So I must acknowledge my colleague here, Dr. Christine Austin, uh, who Christine and I have worked for many years together developing these laboratory methods. And we took the same idea and we transferred it to a single strand of hair because hair also has growth rings in them. So now this test has become really simple. Somebody at home can send us just a few strands of hair that they cut with scissors, put them in a bag and ship them to us. During the pandemic, this was a real advantage because it was difficult to bring our research participants into the hospital because of the risk of exposure to COVID-19. So collecting blood was much harder, but we could still get hair because they could just put that in the mail and, and ship it to us. So first we developed the lab method, but that's not enough. We wanted to do a really robust study. So we did a multinational study in three different countries on approximately 500 children. Not all of them had autism, some had autism, some have what we describe as neurotypical, and some also had other re related conditions such as ADHD or attention deficit hyperactive disorder. We collected their hair and we used our special methods that use lasers and robotics to analyze them. I won't go into all the details and graphs and the, and, and the statistics of the research. This is not that kind of talk, but how do we know that this works? Where can we invite peer review? Of course, we submit it to journals, but in the US, the ultimate arbiter of whether something is clinically useful and can be shared with the public and be used for our patients is the FDA. And that's where I must acknowledge the, the, the foresight of, of Mount Sinai, that they said, well, yes, we must take that next step that so many academics, including myself, are very, very hesitant to take, but take this biomarker out into the public. So Mount Sana helped us establish an entity. It's a startup company. Again, it, it does create my conflict of interest, which I have declared. And for the first time, to the best of my knowledge, the FDA declared that this technology is a breakthrough and it gave us a designation from birth to 21 years of age. I don't know of any other technology that, that can serve as a diagnostic aid in detecting autism for as early as birth. This doesn't mean that we can start delivering this in clinics, but this is the first big step towards getting full FDA approval and then making this technology available to our patients. This is my last slide and I'll take a few moments to just discuss where we are going with this. Well, we've done a study on about 500 patients and the FDA has told us we need to do a larger study, a couple of thousand or slightly more than that to obtain full FDA approval. And that's a very fair ask. And, and, and the whole process with the FDA has actually been um, very educational. We've learned a lot from them and they've been excellent partners in, in guiding us on how to make sure that this is in the best interest of the patients. We also want to make this test widely available. My lab at Mount Sinai is an academic lab. We do many NIH funded research and our mandate is to do more research to develop new technologies, not necessarily to distribute it to tens of thousands of patients. So which is why we've set up this private lab under the name of Linus Biotechnology. But, you know, there is this general, uh, for me at least, there was this concern that once we take this out into a private setting, are we not creating this imbalance between who can access this technology and who cannot? So right from the get-go, we have started engaging uh, insurance, medical insurance providers, 
and Medicaid so that when this technology is ready, we have good evidence to say this must be covered. We are even doing an economic analysis to assure the insurance providers that this is something that is best for everyone, for the patient, as well as for those who are looking at the, 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 the financial impact of delivering this. Wendy's already given a, a very generous introduction. We did write a book. The reason I'm mentioning it here is primarily that this is a core thesis. This is an idea that is not exclusive to autism spectrum disorder. We decided to apply it here first, but my personal vision is that this core idea of looking at the dynamics, the, the time component of how our physiology works will have wide ranging, uh, ranging impacts to many other disorders. So in general terms, that's what we are hoping to achieve in the future. With that, I'll, I'll stop here and thank you again for taking your time to attend these series of talks. Um, it's very important for us to engage with the community and we look back to, we look forward to hearing more from you. And please, um, this is your opportunity, ask whatever questions you have. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aurora, for sharing your amazing research with all of us. Um, and now, now we'll try to answer as many questions as possible in the time we have left. Um, one question many seem to have is if and when you envision this diagnostic tool to be a standard part of newborn screenings. Absolutely. So uh, in, in, in our discussions with the FDA and looking at what is known as the pivotal study, that's FD, FDA terminology in the to do the big study on which on the basis of which the FDA gives approval, we're looking at about a two year time period from now. Over the next six months, we'll be setting up a high throughput lab where we can analyze thousands of samples. We're already working with several collaborators, academic institutions and, and, and otherwise who have patients and we are collecting their hair samples, looking at their clinical data, uh, not just in the US, we have studies now overseas in Europe and Asia. So this will be a multinational effort. At the end of about two years, uh, we hope to have data that can be used for a full submission to the FDA. One of the advantages of having breakthrough designation is that the FDA gives us a, an answer in three months because they have declared that this is a, a breakthrough technology. They have declared that this is a high priority. So they actually fast track the review process. And so I'm optimistic that in about two years, two to three years, it should be ready to you know, make a real impact uh, in the lives of patients. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, that's great news. Um, one question from the audience, uh, what exactly are you measuring in the hair strands? So we're measuring wow. a, a, a whole range of chemicals. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll go into a little bit of depth here. So we have technologies to measure thousands of signatures. As, as you can imagine, um, what we get exposed to and how we metabolize is a very complex soup of things. So we measure thousands and thousands of signatures. However, we only need a, a dozen to two dozen of them in what we call a panel. So that is our autism detection panel, where we take a subset of those biochemical markers, and that gives us a high level of accuracy, over 80%. Our, our, our sensitivity is actually over 90%. So uh, it, it's just that chemical of or, or panel of biochemical signatures. These include things that are outside our body. These include things that are metabolites within our body and, and so on. Um, and, and, and the idea is not to just have this, uh, you know, vague um, biomarker that, that is based on a black box approach with thousands and thousands of signatures. The reason we are being parsimonious in our selection is not just to detect autism, which we believe, I believe very much that we will get there, but also to work with people who are going to develop interventions. I can obviously not give them, oh, here are a thousand pathways. Let's start developing a drug for each of those pathways. We're not going to do that. By having a, a well-defined panel, we can start looking at pharmaceutical interventions, but that has to be a, a narrow list of targets. It, it can't be thousands long, even dozens long is actually a fairly difficult task. So I hope I've answered the reason why we, uh, what we are measuring and why we are measuring uh, only a, a small set of things. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, could you analyze baby hair that is 75 years old? Uh, Absolutely. Would the sample be viable? 
So that's the amazing thing about both teeth and hair. Teeth, I'm anal my oldest sample I've analyzed is 2 million years old, which is from an archeological study. The great thing about hair is that, the, that some biochemical signatures in hair are actually highly stable. And this took us years of development in the lab to find out, find where in the hair do we have a stable signature? So obviously hair is not like blood, it's always exposed to the environment. You know, you're walking down in Manhattan, you're getting exposed to all the fumes from the car, it gets stuck in your hair. So there's a high risk of contamination, but there are layers on the inside of hair that are protected. So I have, we did the study where we collected two samples of hair at around six months of age. We analyzed one right then, we analyzed one five years later. So we tested if over five years there was any loss in signature and there wasn't. So I'm fairly confident that if you have a 75 year old hair sample lying somewhere, it, it would be a nice, it would be worth looking at. Yes. Good. Um, are there differences in autism biomarkers between hair and teeth? Uh, there's, there's a good overlap. There's a significant overlap in pathways we identified. And that's a good thing because that shows us that the signals we are picking up are not uh, specific to one tissue that there's something systemic that's happening. So along with my colleague, Avi Reichenberg, who's at the Autism Center at Mount Sinai, we coined the term systemic uh, element or systemic chemical dysregulation. That's a feature of autism that, you know, there's a met uh, metabolic component. So you will find it in hair, you'll find it in teeth, but it needs the time component. So you don't easily see it in blood because blood is a snapshot. So yes, there is an overlap. There are some unique signatures as well. And I'll stop there, otherwise it becomes a very long answer. Um, how do you account for different variations in hair growth? So we, we a part of our laboratory method is to take that into account. So again, it comes down to looking at, let's say you're looking at two trees. Now, each ring represents a year, no matter how rapidly the tree grows. So in a sense, the biology has already adjusted for that each ring Will represent a fixed time point no matter if you're growing faster or slower. So in, in that sense our laboratory method takes that into account. Great. Um, do you envision that all babies will be screened or a more targeted screening? No, I'm speaking very from a very personal place of just an observer of how um, the public health system works. We are screening for conditions that have a prevalence of 0.0 5% or something. Here is autism that affects two to 3% of children. And we don't screen for that uh, universally at birth. Then some of those conditions that we screen for don't have effective treatments. Here we have options of treatment and yet we don't screen for it. So for me, my vision is that at birth, if your baby has hair, you cut a few snips and we get them analyzed. It's low burden, nothing. Now, not every baby that's born has hair, but we only need a couple of strands. So by six months of age, every child has his hair on their head. We just need a few strands. Everyone should be analyzed. And as we can detect more and more conditions, it'll just become this universal approach that is part of wellness and healthcare. And Amazing. personally, that is my vision that, that one day we reach there. Amazing. Thank you. Um, is there a range for hair sample analysis in terms of ability to intervene or is at birth opt, opt, uh, optimal? So, and again, this is a very astute question. Even the FDA discussed this with us. At every age, uh, uh, an objective and highly accurate uh, detection of autism is beneficial. So let's go very far from birth. And of course, birth, it is useful for early intervention, but let's even look at those who are in adolescence or young adulthood. Even there, many people without a diagnosis uh, or until they had a diagnosis said, well, I didn't know what was going on. But as soon as I got this diagnosis, I joined support groups. I started looking at looking out for therapy and they report back improvements. So, you know, you see studies done on, on, on young adults and they're saying a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder helped them reach out and get appropriate services. And it, it, it's, it's, it's a beneficial cycle because the more they report back, the more services we develop for those needs. If nobody recognizes that there is, is a condition or a need, then how do we actually develop support groups and resources for them? So this creates a very fruitful cycle. I, I believe this test would be helpful for at all ages, but we must prioritize the youngest age groups we obviously, you know, as a society, we prioritize children's 
health um, you know, always. Right, of course. Um, is there any pathway to prevention in the future? That, that would be my, my, one of my, my hopes that by detecting early, we reach a stage where autism becomes a much more manageable diagnosis. I often compare it to diabetes. Most people walking or who have diabetes are pretty much experiencing a very high quality of life because there is a very suitable treatment that they can get to. And as long as you get to it early enough, and most people do, you're managing that. And that's what we are hoping here. In, in just a few studies, they have shown that early intervention will reduce the severity so much that now you're just on a borderline of diagnosis. Those are far and few between. I'm not saying that will always be the case, but you know, times when I daydream, I hope that is that becomes a reality soon and that this technology plays a part in that. Um, what about testing parents? Could that have significance? We, yes, um, you know, we, we have been looking at that uh, especially since it is a heritable condition. So the signature is there in the parents as well. And we are hoping that by testing parents, it becomes a part of just like genetic counseling is, you know, when, when a couple decide to have a, a biological child, they will get tested for several conditions. Um, I, I went through that when my wife and I decided to have ch children. And then you, you say, well, okay, if, you know, if one of you has this condition, but the other one does not, your child is fine, but if both of you have it, you might not be experiencing the symptoms, but uh, the child has a higher risk, so something like that. If you started working on that, that is a longer path. But again, I I'm optimistic that one day we will get there and this will become a universal tool, not just at birth, but also when you're you know, planning to start a family. Thank you. Um, how do people enroll in your studies? So currently we are reaching out to specific uh, centers who have, um, you know, ongoing studies and, and, and clinical data, but we do have a, a website for the, for the company linusbio.com and, and there is a little link to collaborate with us and there is a, a link for the biomarker as well, it's called StrandDX. People can cl click on that and, and send us their questions and obviously if, if you know, they're suitable, we, we can include them in the study. So interesting. Um, is the signal specific to autism or is there overlap with other neurological diseases? So that's again, a very good question because what we are doing is we are saying, well, first of all, autism itself is a spectrum of disorders, but it's often confused with other disorders and other disorders can coexist. For example, ADHD or uh, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. So our biomarker, as we are developing it, we are able to characterize, and we've published on this, that a child who has only autism, a child who has only ADHD, and some children will have both autism and ADHD. So we can even detect comorbid conditions. And we'll keep doing this. We call it, you know, precision phenotyping, that not just giving you a label, you have this, you have autism, but, but telling you what type of autism do you have? Do you have the autism where language is an issue, where attention is an issue, or, or something like that? Because you know, autism is, is a broad range of conditions put all under one umbrella. And to deliver treatment, we have to start accepting these principles of precision medicine. It's not going to be one size fits all. Thank you. Um, are there differences in biomarkers depending on the severity of autism? Yes, so we are seeing a, a correlation with the, with the severity of autism as well. And, and those biomarkers are different to the ones that, that tell us, okay, yes, you have it or not. So uh, for, again, going back to the example of diabetes, there's, there are biomarkers for like, yes, you have diabetes, but then you get regular tests to see whether your diabetes is under control or not. So it's a similar idea here that we can work with clinics who have patients and they can send us a hair every six months. And, and then we can tell them, yes, you, these pathways are improving, whereas these ones, they haven't budged, so they need more intervention. Thank you. Um, could you discuss how the technology you've developed applies to other diseases? We, we are currently uh, uh, preparing to submit in the next three months or so on a Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. So that's one other condition on which we've analyzed significant number of samples. And then we'll be submitting to the FDA to get you know, we, we invite peer review and, and to get their feedback. 
So that's one of the conditions. But uh, the, the long-term aim is to apply it to a broad range of, uh, of conditions. Uh, the, the cool thing for me as a laboratory person is that it's the same technology platform, whether the hair is coming from someone who's interested in autism or Lou Gehrig's disease, which are at the opposite ends of life. It doesn't matter. The same platform will analyze the hair <clears throat> in the same manner. And we purposely put an immense amount of effort in, in, in designing it like that, because we don't want to be a one disease, one solution sort of approach. We want one solution that impacts healthcare broadly. Uh, we are working on pediatric cancer, um, IBD or gastric disorders, and a bunch of other neurodevelopmental disorders. Amazing. Um, where can we have the most impact to reduce our personal environmental exposures? Where should we focus our energy? That, that's a very broad question, and I'll, I'll answer it in very general terms because each person's situation varies very much. So most of us, uh, you know, we, we have immense control over what we do in our household. So as much as we can, we should, you know, look at our diet, our nutrition, the quality of our, our water. The other location for adults is, is our workplace exposures. So again, you know, we might not have as much control over it, especially if you're in, in an industry which, which deals with chemicals and stuff. But more and more as occupational medicine starts looking at them, and we again have a very strong program there, protection of exposures at the, at the workplace. <clears throat> We must also not forget the importance of the social environment. The environment is not just a bunch of chemicals. You know, a, a healthy social network has repeatedly been shown to be a very important factor in how happy we are, how healthy we are. So I always, you know, tell parents, you know, just by the fact that you reached out to me shows me that your child has won a small lottery because you're obviously very invested in your child's future and, and being good parents. So that aspect itself is something that, that has been shown repeatedly to be positively associated with, with many health outcomes. Thank you. What do you think of saving cord blood for analysis? There are already many cord blood banks based at academic centers, hospitals, and also private company. And there's an immense amount of, of research. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the reason I don't use cord blood much myself is because it's a snapshot in time. It doesn't have the have the temporal signature. It only is measuring exposure at that time or some measure of cumulative exposure. But there are many other scenarios in which cord blood is very useful. So I'm not saying don't store it, uh, but it's something that you must discuss with, with, with your physician to get a clear picture of the value of, 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 of that. Thank you. Uh, can you describe the resources at Mount Sinai for parents who are concerned about environmental exposures, either in their home or community? Uh, absolutely. So um, the, the easiest place to go would be to the Mount Sinai Institute for Exposomic uh, website, where it will link you to various uh, other resources. For example, we have a pediatric environmental health spe specialty unit, which develops uh, information as well as you know, clinical guidance on a whole range of pediatric environmental health issues. So as a first step, you know, land on the Mount Sinai Institute for Exposomic Research website. There is a contact us page. If, if, you, if you don't find what you're looking for, drop us a, drop us a note and, and we'll, we'll guide you. Great, thank you. Uh, could you tell us more about your new book and who should read it? Thank you, Wendy. Um, so uh, the new book is called Environmental Biodynamics. Uh, uh, and as the name suggests, it's got a big focus on the environment, our biology. But we have said that the link between our biology and our environment can only be really understood through the lens of time or temporal dynamics. Uh, who should read it? Uh, nerds. Nerds who love the environment, <laughs> nerds who love science and knowledge. Uh, if you have read books like uh, Chaos by James Gleick, who's one of my favorite authors, uh, and I've tried to write in that style, I, I think you will like it. But it, it, is, it is not a book that meets you, you know, it, it's not a layback and just uh, an easy, it's not the Harry Potter kind of read, let me say it this way. You <laughs> might have to jump on Wikipedia and look up a few words. You know, that's why I'm saying it's for the nerds who want to walk away, but you'll walk away learning a lot. You'll walk away wondering, oh, why didn't I think of that? Or, or isn't it, it fascinating that 
you know, we've built a healthcare system entirely on snapshot technology, whether it's a urine test or a blood test, we just do snapshots. We never really focus on time. So yeah, I hope I've answered that question in some way. Yes, you probably have a few nerds on this uh, webinar. I I'm hoping so. <laughs> I'm one. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm proud to be a nerd, yes. Um, uh, why is this research happening at Mount Sinai and is it happening anywhere else? Mount Sinai has been a, a wonderful academic institution and, and uh, you know, working with Dr. Robert Wright, who's the chair of my department, and who's been a real proponent of innovation in the field of environment. It's just been wonderful. Uh, what's special about uh, working here at Sinai is just this uh, emphasis on innovation. Uh, I always tell folks, you know, who are looking at uh, where to do their training or postdoctoral research, that we, we are probably not the biggest academic center in the, in the country, but we are one of the most innovative ones. And, and that, that's, that's been a, a real pleasure being here. Great, thank you. Um, here's another. Um, do you have any advice for couples thinking about having children um, other than you know, the advice you gave about healthy food, water? Is there any, to have a healthy pregnancy, any other advice? It, it, it's way outside. Or maybe you my, answered it already. It's, it's outside my area of training, but as a parent, uh, as a parent of triplets, um, I'll give a very general non-medical answer. Make sure you look after each other uh, and, and enjoy enjoy the journey. It's, it's been fantastic. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, maternal health is just a, a, a very important uh, area of medical science. Speak to your physician and doctors, you know, and again, you know, if you're concerned about environmental exposures specific to pregnancy, uh, go to the Institute website and we have, we have material there. We have some resources, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, and I think we're getting to our final question. Um, so what do you envision for the next five years? Uh, do, what are the possibilities that you see in the near future? Uh, I'm hoping even 10 that, years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. In, in, in the next three to five years, I'm hoping that this hair biomarker technology starts being used as a diagnostic aid, along with various other tools. It becomes part of a standard toolbox that helps children who are, are at higher risk of autism spectrum disorder and related conditions like ADHD. That's the short-term vision um, or, or the five-year vision. What I'm hoping for in the long-term we really have a big impact. We almost redefine what it means to, to seek healthcare. Isn't it bizarre that you know my relationship with some apps on my cell phone is, is, is more you know you know more in depth than my relationship with my physician? I think my Uber Eats apps knows more about my nutritional habits than my my, my family physician does. You know, uh, depending on what I buy from Amazon, they probably know when I'm in exercise mode and when I'm just you know watching movies day and night. Why is it that our healthcare is built around these snapshot technologies? Uh, that needs to change. And it might sound like a very philosophical answer, but I, I, I'm, I'm very committed that a time has come that we start redefining, not disrupting, there are many good aspects of healthcare, but redefining healthcare and environmental medicine will play a very big part because for so long it's been ignored and, 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 and it cannot be ignored any, any longer. Thank you. And do you see this catching on with other researchers or? You know? I think just like genomics became a core technology and a tool for every uh, branch of medical uh, and health research, environmental medicine will do that. We, we don't have a choice now with climate change becoming such an important issue, social environments, what's happening in Europe. We are so interconnected. We impact each other in profound ways. Uh, the environment, there is no choice but to realize environmental medicine is absolutely essential to the future of, of our healthcare. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Aurora, and to everyone who joined us today to hear this amazing work. Um, there's a link in the chat to an evaluation survey, if, and it would be really helpful if you could all please take a minute to complete it. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you to Dr. Aurora again, and have a great day.